Um, so my name is Judy Klugman, as Steve. So I do have a few years in this market. I joined Swissery in 1999 to um, develop the investor base. So and I've been doing the exact same thing since 99, trying to create greater accessibility for the institutional investor marketplace. So this panel discussion on how do we create a more robust, accessible market is near and dear to my heart. And I'm thrilled that my fellow panelists have agreed to be um, with us today on this session. So all the way on my left, your right, is Philip Kusha, who we once, we grew up together in this industry, and he is now um, head, and we have Al Sully is taking <laughs> photos, the paparazzi is here. Um, we have Philip Kusha, who is the head of ILS um, and Capital Solutions at Tiger Risk. He is a partner there, um, and representing another broker, dealer, perspective. And then we have Dave Flipman, who is CEO of SafePoint, and he has been um, a prolific issuer um, of cat bonds in our market, the 144A cat bond market. And um, we also have Chris Caponegro, who is the head of ILS at AXA ILS. And, Access. Oh, Access. Sorry. <laughs> Access. Um, and, and, and what's interesting about Chris is that he is also, so all, all four of us have been in this market collectively for decades. We've been there, done that, seen it all. And really the challenge for us is, and we all have different perspectives, but I think that as we sort of collected our thoughts um, in the run up to this session, you know, we have some, generally speaking, similar views. And, and as we think about accessibility, there's both the short term. Um, you know, we heard some comments earlier about some of the disappointments from an investor perspective of how this asset class is performed. So what do we do to think about for those types of investors that have been disappointed, how do we create a more robust market going forward so we bring back those investors to the fold? Um, and when we think about accessibility too, I think it's important to point out is that this market, when we say ILS, that is a very broad term. It includes the 144A bond market of which that is what our specialty is at Swiss Re Capital Markets. We help both our parent um, and its clients access the 144A tradable bond market. Um, it is made up of sidecars of um, various reinsurance companies where you're going alongside by side, where those are generally speaking one-year contracts. There are collateralized reinsurance. So there's a lot of different ways to participate in this market. Um, some perhaps have performed a little differently than others, shall we say. And so what, what we're here to talk about is how do we bring more institutional investors to this market, create the greater accessibility? And I guess, Chris, I'll kick it off with you. You know, you were in your past life a very prolific user of the cap on market from a sponsor perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, and now that you're at Access, which has used lots of different, you know, all the different products that I've mentioned, you know, you at Access ha have um, utilized. So what do you think, like, how can we create greater value so that you can be a more prolific issuer? Like, w what are your views on all this? Sure. No, thank thanks, Judy. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for having me here today. Um, it's interesting. So at, at Access, we, we're... we're um, accessing ILS and institutional investors through um, our North Shore cap bond issuance on the mm -hmm. shorter duration side of our, of our um, offerings, our sidecars, we have multi-line structures and all the way out to like our Harrington restructure, which is an asset liability part joint venture with uh, Blackstone. All, all, those, all those vehicles generally work pretty well for the purpose that they were set to do. And each one requires a lot of work, attention, time, uh, management with investors, management internally, people, resources, et cetera. So like everything right now generally seems to work. But when now I've been in the role for about like nine months and I look at that and I go, all right, nothing here is repeatable, scalable, you know, truly economic for both the investor and the sponsor. And so and, and also there's, you know, what we've seen through stress periods, which was good for everyone to witness, is that there's there are challenges on every approach. You know, whether you took one approach with a sidecar or someone else took an approach with an independent fund with collateral issues, there, there's all kinds of challenges that everyone has. And so like when I look at the ILS sector from a big picture, and then I'll answer your mm -hmm. question, like we're, we're at like a $100 billion segment that probably should be a, a trillion dollars today, but is stuck at 100 billion because 
you know, we're in this like eye wall replacement cycle phase where no one really knows what the best approach to be scalable, repeatable, and economic for both the sponsor and the institutional investor should look like. And what we really need to do is, you know, instead of trying to optimize each of these vehicles as we see them today, we, we actually have to take a step back and say, what is actually the optimum solution? Not necessarily like just trying to take everything that we see in front of us and make it work for everyone. I think that that generally has worked, but limits this whole sector to $100 billion right now. To get to the next level, I think we have to take that step back, look through the entire value chain, see what the investors are seeking, and then build it ground up from the insured policy all the way through that channel to be able to have something that's more scalable and repeatable and supportable by the institutional investors. So very long answer to that. Well, but. so Chris is advocating for a wholesale change to the value chain, from all the way from the policyholder all the way to sort of the seller of protection. So that is certainly a very admirable long-term goal. But in the here and now, with what when you think about putting your protection together, like Dave, the, the two of you, how sure. do you think about what what are the products that you want to access the broadest possible audience, also cognizant of some of the failures of some of the segments of our market? So as we heard from Mike earlier, you know, with the issues that we've had perhaps on the collateralized re-segment and the surprises and the trapped capital, you know, keeping those issues in mind, how do you think about, or maybe, and then how would you work with the broker, with the Philip, you know? So I want this to be, you know, very, uh, an interactive discussion. We don't have to answer it. And it's almost like a fireside chat, hopefully, that we can have for the next hour. So what would you think yeah. in the more near term as, rather than, yes, the wholesale chain, but for this year, how do you think about it for Axis? So it, it, it's actually horrible. Oh, okay. Because when you think about it. We didn't discuss that, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, we didn't. And now I'm saying, okay. like, Axis does a fine job with it. We have a lot of people working hard all the time to make sure we have appropriate, uh, you know, uh, capital from our, our, our private investors mm -hmm. as well as our public investors, and everyone is reasonably happy. It's hard to keep everyone happy, right? right? But like, once you take on an insurance policy and then start collecting them, by the time you get to the end, all of a sudden I'm buying cap bonds, I'm buying sidecars, I'm buying, you know, you know, we're looking at other hedges, we're looking at everything else. And the reality is it's, it's not as simple as like, say, the mortgage market where someone issues a mortgage, it's going to have a duration of seven to 10 years, they can pull them together, and then the end investor knows exactly what the pricing is of the upfront risk because they know exactly what the risk they're taking is and what the price is, mm -hmm. and they can package it together and sell it off. And now that you know the mortgage market outstanding is five point five trillion dollars of of securities fully collateralized, right? So like our our process is you take these policies, you see where you get some diversification, you diversify other places, and then you have to buy out the peaks and you know sometimes you're you know don't have enough money to buy out those peaks and so you have to think about running more peak to buy out the non peak like so it, it's just not a perfect system. And frankly I think you know the challenge to the youth out there today, though I don't see too much youth in this room, uh, other than uh, you know more, more people my, my age. But but really, if you look at like the insure tech and everything they're doing, like just start fresh, you know, right? Start writing policies that maybe are more monoline, okay? Which it used to be in the U.S. before ISO came out and bundled them all together and made an all risk policy. But like so monoline, and then just then start having simpler conversations with investors because they, they know exactly what they're getting. Maybe it's not an annual policy that benefits brokers a lot, right? But maybe it's a perpetual policy that only gets changed every five to seven years or something as the homeowner needs to, right? Which allows you to have a pool of securities that you know what's in them to be able to securitize, right? So like a lot of, all right, so what do I do next year? I have to keep doing, I have to keep doing what I'm doing okay. and, keep, and keep trying to find ways that it's more transparent and scalable and economic for an investor, more so than for the sponsor, right? So it's more about how do I attract more capital into this industry? Because right. it's only 100 billion. That's nothing. Yeah. That is nothing. We are such a niche market. It doesn't get anyone's attention because it's not big enough. So how do you make it bigger? You have to be more transparent. You have to be uh, and much more um, efficient at what we're doing to bundle it. Now it's time for someone else. I think. Okay, I was say, so, so Dave, what is your perspective sure. on this? Well, well, you know, I mean, 
Our view is that um, you know we're we're agnostic when it comes to like whether we're going to purchase you know uh, traditional we insurance or use cap bonds. Uh, I, I, I've really been excited about the cap bond product from like the first time I was exposed to it almost 20 years ago, and you know we we were investors of it, um, issuers back in my reinsurance days. So I've seen a lot of different sides of this, and you know uh, I, I thought it was really great when I moved over to uh, when we started SafePoint in uh, 2013. You know, there's a really exciting pivot point where you start seeing citizens getting much more realistic pricing for cap bonds. So we were investors of cap bonds in the past and issuers, and there were different reasons why it made sense, but it wasn't, you know, uh, it, was, it was really more of a sideshow. And I think that's really the problem with the ILS and the cap bond market is it's never really lived up to its promise. You know, as Chris, Chris has said, is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of limiting factors. I mean, we could have had this discussion like 15 years ago uh, where, where folks were saying, well, the cap bond market should have a bigger piece of the pie, but at the same time, some of the biggest investors in the cap bond market were insisting on everything being parametric or PCS, and yeah, that's great, but you know, you're know, you not going to attract you know, folks like myself you know, and make us house that kind of risk. You know? so, so, so I think you always have that kind of push-pull. Um, the, the irony is, you know, the, I mean, the theory is, given the fact that the cap bond market has a conduit to, you know, large institutional investors, you think you'd be able to do deals a lot quicker. But um, I, I just think back of, like, my, my, my experiences when I first moved from insurance into reinsurance, I was amazed at how, like, you know, I'm working on a, on a treaty and we come up with the terms and negotiate it, and I'm like, okay, that's it. We just agreed and we just wrote $10 million of income, and it was like... You know, it was a, a couple of a couple of nights, you know, and a and a couple of discussions, and I'm like, well, this is so much faster than what I had to do on the admitted side and in insurance with developing products and building out systems, and you know, you'd think the same sort of you know the same kind of levels of efficiency you should see in a cap bond market versus reinsurance, but I think that's where the cap bond market, you know, the ILS market still is kind of lagging is. They don't have that same level. They don't have that same rapport with the clients, where they have the comfort where they can drop down bespoke, you know, large lines pretty quickly. You know, so that there's there's a lot of structuring costs, there's a lot of inefficiency in the product. I mean, at the same time, there there are some places where it can be really exciting. You know, we were talking before about like some of these risks are so large. You know, like look at like ILWs, for example. I've talked to, over the years, at least half a dozen folks that have tried to set up ILW exchanges. You know, why doesn't that work? I mean, if we if we're all agree that PCS is 50 billion and 100 billion, you know, indexes are going to cost five and seven or whatever the market wants, why, why can't you get people to, to just agree to, to exchange trade that as opposed to having to pay brokers and write, you know, you know, Bespoke contracts and have you know have negotiations and all these other links in the chain. So yeah, it, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's it's exciting that the cap bond market has finally grown to at least some scale. But you know, I, I think to Chris's point, the risks are growing probably even faster than the cap bond market. So they might be further afield now than they were ten years ago. You know, just one perspective before I get to you, Philip, yeah, that yeah. I just feel, as Steve says, I, I do have opinions. You know, one of the things that I heard as a salesperson very early on in this, you know, trying to market the asset class is that the investors um, were sort of a bit skeptical that there was the asymmetry of information, that the buyer knew a lot more about the risk that was passing through than they did. And, and so that was the challenge that we were faced very early on and that we're still faced with is, and that, I think, Dave, is what creates the sort of enormity of the process and the documentation is trying to create, and this goes to Mike, your, your point about transparency. Like, in the one, it was never meant, the 144A, this particular segment of the market, was never meant to cannibalize reinsurance that there is a place for both parties, for that handshake, for that discussion, for those bespoke trades, but for sort of to, to create that scalability in the volume and to really tap into the promise of this broader institutional investor marketplace, there has to be a way where there is, you don't have the surprises. I think that for the most part, I see so many familiar faces. Investors want, I mean, I don't want to say they want to take losses, but they understand that that's part of 
you know, the trade, that if there were never losses, then you guys would never buy the protection. So you have to have losses, but what is challenging is if there are surprises, that if the product that you invested in did not perform as you thought it should be, you know, how it should react, that is wherein lies the problem. So I think that when we think about creating this new sort of ecosystem, it is sort of how do you create these different pockets of capital, whether it's reinsurance capital, whether it's the 144A tradable liquid um, alongside maybe somehow private bespoke from the ILS managers who you know, have a different level of sophistication than sort of the broad-based money managers. So I think that there's a place in the products for everybody and perhaps that we all have to do a better job of how we educate both the sponsors and the investors. And, and maybe this is where I'll throw it to you, Philip, that you know, you've done an ex, we've worked very closely with Philip at um, Tiger Risk of, on two recent transactions that are for brand new sponsors who had just tremendous reception um, in, in today's current market. So, you know, I'll be for, first to raise my hand that the market is a little choppy right now, but yet these two brand new companies just had overwhelming support. And so what do you attribute that to? So that when you work with your brokers and you're looking for sponsors, what are the characteristics? How do you sell it? What do you think is appropriate to tap into this broader um, investor capital? Yeah, yeah no, I'm happy to give kind of the perspective. I mean, it sounds like we're discussing also a slightly different uh, kind of perspective. So the, the true, how can we get this market to a trillion dollars, which I'm sure many people here want to see, um, to how can, we, how can we kind of optimize, and, and I think, Chris, to your point, how can we optimize today's right. products or to, to lead to further growth, to make them more user-friendly, to make them better understand or have investors better understand them, um, which really comes with innovation and other things. So I think specifically on your question, Sudi, on new new sponsors and 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 how can they best be introduced to the market i think um certainly i think market timing is i think important though i think there's certainly times in the market where it's a lot easier to introduce new sponsors and and other times where it's maybe more difficult um i think the approach we took were, was really try to keep things very simple and i think it goes back to the transparency and the surprise point or start with kind of a named peril only cover in one state or very very confined covered area Try to be kind of as transparent as you can. Also, pick expected loss bands, which are not kind of too far, too, too, too low in that sense to kind of create uh, too much kind of concern. Um, but then, really going back to the transparency, really, yeah, be very clear on the reporting side. Um, maybe overshare some information, which which wasn't historically necessarily done, or on providing more frequent exposure reports, or others. Um, and then really kind of trying to clearly articulate kind of the, 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 the underwriting approach, the claims approach of, of, of these kind of companies. And, and frankly, I think the, the, the last two pieces are thoughtful pricing to some degree or to make sure that that reflects also um, um, where investors see value in these types of transactions and, 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 and kind of pre-marketing and other kind of type discussions to make sure that, um, that there are some, some, some buy-in. And uh, certainly, I think as Julie said at the beginning, or I think uh, a lot of the people in this room know each other, I think there's, uh, I think everybody wants to make this market kind of work. Um, so I think there's constructive participation, but at the end, it's obviously a marketplace as well. So I think really uh, tr trying to kind of work within those confines, I think help, help some of those transactions, I think be, be, be very well received. Um, but again, I think on, on these questions on like how, how can the market kind of grow further, um, yeah, again, I think the, 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 the transparency I think we kind of talked about and I think a prior panel talked about as well seems to be a, a, a key kind of a key consideration. I think the, 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 the one kind of bigger question is also how, 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 how can this be applied to not shrink the risk pool further? So obviously starting up with a, with a single peril transaction in a confined area is a great approach to kind of enter into the cat bond market. And I think for growing companies, I think that can be a, a very good strategy. Um, but in order to grow this market, obviously, there's the market needs to get comfortable to assume other risks and, and broader risks and, and, and also um, yeah, be, be more comfortable and educated with those as well. And I think, Chris, you mentioned some of those points earlier on, um, yeah, that, that obviously you have it's a very complex eco ecosystem where, where if, if, if you only get parametric protection at the end of the, the chain, that, that, that still doesn't deliver the product you need. 
But I, so, but what's fascinating for Dave, for someone like you, that's a growing company. You're, you know, you're diversifying, and and that's certainly, I would think, great news for your equity investors. But maybe cap on investors see that growth, and maybe they don't. You know, one of the things that distinguishes the cap on market from traditional reinsurance is that our market is, generally speaking, a multi year transaction because. The you know upfront costs are such that you have to amort you know to really make it efficient you have to amortize it over multi years, but maybe that multi year aspect is a bit of a hindrance it, it like handcuffing you to a certain extent to a growing company because as we're just all talking about transparency and investors need to know sort of what they're buying into perhaps that's one of the issues that you're facing um, with this using this type of market for a growing company that is sort of diversifying in its you know region and scope and if investors don't want surprises maybe would you ever consider if we were able to somehow figure out how to get the cost down would you consider a one year transaction yeah i mean i think so you know the the, the issue is um we, we we've gone pretty far down the rabbit hole was we actually collected on some cap bonds and there's a lot of hidden costs and there's a lot of big differences. When you even look at like ILS, you know, like collateralized contracts versus cap bonds, just, you know, who takes some of that risk when you have that uncertainty of, you know, are you on risk or off risk? And, you know, who's, who, you know, like committing to a reserve number, you know, and then, and then figuring out after the fact that, oh, I actually had a loss that's smaller than that, you know, um, now I got to go make up and pay you for risk payments for coverage that I didn't think right. I had available. So there's, you know, Paying for claims people to to go and review the claims, and then you, you get these folks scrutinizing questions like, "Hey, well, wait, wait a minute. In this file here, you have this number that you're calling LAE versus not." I mean, we don't have these kind of challenges on the traditional market. Um, right. uh, so, so yeah, I, 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 I think there's there's a lot of complexity around around that. Um, I, I think that the issue with multi-year is, you know, it's it, it's two sided risk, right? The uh, you know the customers locking in costs. You know, so if the markets, you know, so so there are advantages and disadvantages to that. And the same thing with the investor, um, and 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 the dynamism of you know the portfolio changing. I mean, that's sort of priced. I'd argue that some of that's priced into the risk. Our our view back in the um, flagstone days was that the cap bonds we were clearly paying more for than what we were doing on the traditional market side, but. Our argument was the ability to do a bespoke structure and in size, and having some of those reset features that you know we were paying for each of those things, and it was worthwhile. But um, you know, then you had you know funds like you know uh, Nafila setting up Quill, where all of a sudden you didn't have to go and do a cap bond for 100 million, 150 million, as they they had large enough funds where they could go and write write lines like that. So I think you know uh, I think the market keeps keeps evolving and. You know, I mean, uh, it, I, I think the, the, strong, the strongest part of multi-line coverage is that, I mean, sorry, multi-year coverage is the fact that we as insurers are committing to multiple years when we're writing our, our customers. So there is a certain nice alignment there. Um, as a reinsurer, and, I, and as I said, I've gone back and forth being an insurer and a reinsurer, it was novel, the ability that you could turn it on and turn it off within a year period. But the reality is, it's a little illusory because reinsurers actually still have pretty consistent kind of relationships over, over a number of years. And, and then how does, when you think about this, how does also pricing factor into it? When we think of traditional versus whether it's the cap bond or collateralized re, um, you know, accessing different types of institutional money. Yeah, I, I think some of it's just the market. Look, the, the you know, like we we could look at the same thing with the stock market, or, or the stock's rich or poor. And, and mm -hmm. I think you know, another way of uh, you know, maybe maybe it's a punt is just say the market's always right. So whatever, whatever the cap bond market and the traditional market want to charge, that's ultimately uh, that's a cost feature that goes into my insurance product. It happens to be my largest expense, so. Uh, you know, I'm keenly interested in, in in predicting it correctly, or having a good set, and not having too many surprises. Because I run uh, I run a cash flow. Uh, the, the big challenge that I'm going to run, let's say, in a dynamic year like this year, is I'm going to buy most of my reinsurance at June first. If let's say I have a significant price increase, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to scramble and put a rate filing in. It could take better part of like six months for me to start rolling those price increases on my book. 
and it'll take me better than 12 to 18 months before I start realizing it. So I'm making my payments now, and it takes me 18 months to, to, realize. to, to, to realize it. So it's really, it's less about what that price is and more about, you know, what those changes are and, and, and just being, uh, you know, uh, being able to adapt to it. Yeah, and I think on that point, well, I think the, the uh, uh, kind of on the market point, I think the, predictable of the, mar the predictability of the marketplace and especially in respect of pricing is obviously something which factors into a lot of the discussions we're having as well. Or I think, the, as, as you said, or putting a cap on together is not overnight or it's like a three months kind of process. So I think certainly what we... What we what we're seeing often in the marketplaces or uh, terms are relatively attractive, and while price is not the, the only driver of a lot of the discussion, it's certainly being factored in. Um, oftentimes, or you see attractive cap on conditions, uh, the pipeline gets kicked off, um, but only materializes three months later when the market environment might be very different, um, and 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 that's kind of a perpetual cycle to some degree. Or that um, then then maybe more capital comes in, but it comes three months later when the pipeline kind of is is, is essentially reduced again. Also, I think kind of being mindful of that as well. Where I agree that that the market obviously plays an important role. Or I think being also mindful of managing the pipeline on the on the investor side as well, I think is, 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 is maybe another important feature which, which helps students plan for using that capacity um, kind of going forward. Yeah. You know, and one thing that's interesting that we haven't touched upon yet is, you know, over, you know, the two decades, you know, two and a half decades the market's been um, around, there have been a lot of changes um, to structures. Um, there's been the advent, and some of the structures have really grown up in the cap-on market and then have filtered into the traditional, such like aggregate transaction, which I think provided real um, value to sponsors. But I think, you know, that perhaps the structuring, whether it's us or Tiger or Aon, all of us on the broker, perhaps we were a little too aggressive in the, in the terms and conditions that we included in these vehicles, in these structures, and um, and so there were a lot of surprises or losses that investors weren't aware. And so maybe that's also another angle we can think about in terms of creating a greater accessibility is, are there structural changes to any of our products that you think that can help sort of still create value for the sponsor, but creates greater predictability for the investor? So there's less volatility. I think that in these aggregate transactions, one of the issues for investors is that they just didn't believe the risk assessment. And if you don't believe the risk assessment, you can't price something if there isn't a common language on how much risk you're taking. And so Tiger and Swiss Re, Philip and you know our teams, we worked together on a transaction for farmers where we did, in fact, tweak the structure. And I think that that created the ability to allow that to sell. But so, Chris, I don't know. Are there structural changes that rather than, I, and I know the big, big picture, but do you see anything that we can do? I don't even mean around the edges, but that perhaps there are structural things we can do to, to bring these, you know, greater, you know, greater acceptance among investors. Sure. Well, thanks. So I don't want people to leave saying, oh, Chris is just big picture. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't know what he's going to do next year. But, like, I, I think that when the, the real challenge is, you know, you say, oh, well, for the investors, you know, like, we need to make it more predictable and more reliable and everything else. But, like, then that just pushes, you know, it's like, when you have floodwaters coming into your house, right, and you put a big dam up, it goes to the to the next household, right? So the next household here would be the reinsurer then to hold it. And why should they hold it? Well, they have held it for many of the years, but like they shouldn't hold it either. And the, the reality is, you have to you have to know what you're selling, be transparent about what you're selling, communicate that up the value chain. If you're going to get interested investors for it, you have to price for it. And that's probably the, the biggest argument that investors have is that, you know, not only did I know about this, but how much premium did you say you collected for this? Oh, nothing? Okay, that, that's a really bad answer, right? So, like, let's, again, start from the beginning, you know, insurers, reinsurers, try to assess the perils, define the perils, define some sort of premium in that chain for it, and have it filter up so that you can have more indemnity-based things, less parametric-based, less index-based, because... Yeah, I can go out and buy indexed cap bonds at the top end of my capital stack, but like, there's so much more risk that we're shouldering as risk grows on our balance sheet that that I'm not getting that coverage for. So, 
it's not helpful then to the reinsurer. Yeah, maybe you know the issuance in the cap bond market goes from 35 to 40 billion, but but realistically, you're not really helping serve the client base that really needs those cap bonds. Well, the the cap bond market should be three, four hundred billion, and the amount of of risk transferred a substantial amount more, and. You know, you'll see right now, there's, right now I'm going back to the big picture, right? So like all the public insurance companies, everything else, everyone's taking less cat risk, right? And what's happened over the last 10 years for risk? Well, the last 10 years of risk, we've had no inflation and risk in urbanization has created, I don't know, two, two and a half X the amount of value and the amount of demand needed. Now we're in hyperinflation. I don't know, has anyone gone and remembered what it costs to buy a meal here in New York two years ago pre-COVID and now tried to buy the same meal? It's more than double, right? So like you look at where we're headed next three to five years with high inflation and continued urbanization and everything else, we don't have enough capital. And ILS needs to figure out a solution here to go from 100 billion X amount more because it, it's going to be remarkable the amount of cat capacity demand, cyber demand, you know, in three to five years, Elon's gonna have a demand for all the payloads he's sending up into space and we're gonna have to cover that too with, you know, a lot of capital, right? So like you, you look at these things, that's not coming from public balance sheets which are restricting the amount of volatility, restricting the amount of risk they have on their books. So to, to try to answer that question. We need to find a way that you get indemnity cover or, or narrow down the coverage that's sold on the front end so that we can get more coverage through the value chain and people are accepting that risk and accepting the price they're getting for that risk and willing to take much more of it on a transparent basis. So, so would you argue then, and this is, we haven't talked about this particular, so this you is can, just a, a, like a yeah. free, for all, free for all conversation, that an all risk policy that we should go Awful. to. Okay. So but, I, 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 mean, I, all right. You know, if if we big, were all, if right. we were all sitting down here going, right. wow, we've never had a community way of, right. of covering risk. But like today, like we've seen all these perils and everything else. And we want to, as a profiting, a, a profit taking company, want to go uh, sell something to the public. Would you go and say, I'll cover you for everything? I don't know what it is, Banca coverage for everything, and I'm going to accept the premium for the risks I know about. Like that doesn't work. No, no, no. And, and I think from a salesperson perspective, and trying to sort of translate our market to a broader fixed income market, that is ultimately the challenge. Is that you know the broader market, you know, institutional investors have issues, and not most of you in the room. You guys are all specialists and are very sophisticated, but. You know, an institutional investor doesn't, they're not going to buy something if they can't price it, and they're not going to be able to price it if they can't understand what is yeah. what is that risk that they're taking. And so that, I think, is ultimately the challenge, is that we cannot literally pass through the entire kitchen sink to institutional investors. And so when I think about structural changes, how do we minimize that volatility? Do we go, and I'll just throw out, from a franchise deductible to an event deductible on event. You know, there's, I mean, I could rattle off a lot of different things, but those are the challenges that we face in that I don't think that we can be all things to all people. And so it goes back to my original statement of there is a place for institutional capital. There is a place for reinsurers. And I, and I am probably talking my own book since I am, I'm at Swiss Re, so you know we, we, we do want a robust reinsurance market, but it, it really does actually make sense. There is a certain level of sophistication, you know, you know, tons of underwriters um, and institutional capital that can take up the more standardized named and so that you don't have um, the surprises. And somehow we just have to find that sort of happy medium. And I, and I don't know, Philip, how do you, like when you're speaking to your clients, how do you think about that on what can be transferred into the capital markets? And also, I know that you've been, you know, we, we were chatting about this last night, that you're also very active in helping to raise capital for sidecars, for fun. How, how do you think about sort of the different investor bases? You don't have to name names, but sort of what is the appropriate product? Like how do you think of, because obviously you're going to a very broad market, 
Um, how do you think about who do you approach and how do you sell it? And, and I think that that just helps inform us about how do we create the product that makes sense for both SafePoint and for Axis. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of the, the, I mean, uh, there's obviously different kind of approaches. So I think there's the kind of cat bond approach of uh, providing, and then I think that's kind of to your to question earlier on how, how can you make these products, including aggregate products, more accessible. I think one is being more transparent, providing more information, and, and, and interacting with an investor base who can analyze that information, um, which naturally will hinder to some degree the scalability because it will require people to act in a similar way than a reinsurance company or have, have similar resources in that way. Um, but even there, I think a lot can be done. I think, and you mentioned the farmers transaction where I think we, we provided a lot of that information and I think investors appreciated and analyzed it and, and I think it helped them understand the, the, the pricing of, of, of what that would entail. Or, um, I think if we shift to like sidecars and funds and others, or I think you're shifting into a very different investor sentiment where those investors cannot price the risk and they don't claim to, and they rely on experts or alignments or alignment of interest to, from, from, from reinsurers or, or funds or others um, to provide kind of that expertise. Or, so I think they are um, that that's really, they're thinking about the alignment, I think, in the first place. I think they're thinking about our track record and performance and, and, and things like that, very similar to any other fund strategy or hedge fund strategy which is out there. Um, and, and, and they're obviously, looking back over the last five years, continue to raise concerns around how profitable is it? Is, did you charge for everything? Did you know... Uh, you, you know, are the margins sufficient, and, and is the volatility in line with the numbers you kind of showed me? You know? And I think there are some, in some cases, I think everything stacks up, and others it doesn't, though, and, and that obviously leads to kind of some concern. Um, I, th I think the third point to make is, though, I think the, 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 the in, in theory, this, the, another approach would be, rather than providing investors all the necessary information, is to create a truly liquid market, which ultimately, similar to the equity other markets, or kind of you, you have experts interacting in that, that space, and, and you just rely on the market for the market price, or in, and and so you don't have to analyze it because you, like David said, the market is right. <laughs> if you truly believe that, um, then then you actually don't have to analyze all the information. You just have to analyze some of the fundamentals. Um, but we're not there yet, though the liquidity to that degree is not there. The, the size of the market is not there. So I think that's probably in the in a similar bucket to what Chris mentioned at the beginning, or that's more long term. Um, kind of plan, but I think in the short term it is things like or transparency, regular reporting, providing historical information, not only modeling information. And, and, and again, I think being very transparent, to not trying to arbitrage the system, but, but, but trying to really kind of, yeah, try to come with a true risk for transfer product, which is ultimately kind of benefits both sides of the investor and the client. Right. And, I, and I think that, honestly, there has been a lot of sort of arbitrage behavior in our market over the years. And I, you know, and we are where we are now, I think, because of that. And, and I think that things are changing and, and these structures are, and we keep using the same terms as, you know, transparency and no surprises, but, uh, you know, we have evolved, we've listened, we've seen, we've learned um, from sort of these past structures. But how do we, and I, because I certainly don't have the answer to this at all, but I, would, I love your vision, Chris, of this large liquid, and Philip, the market is the one that sets the price. But I struggle to figure out how do we get there? Like, how do we get to that bigger sort of new ecosystem, and I keep using that word, um, so to speak? Well, I'm just sitting here thinking about this. I mean, like, if you, obviously there's regulation and different states and everything else, so all that compounds issues for making real change happen. But I mean, if you look at where, where does capital really need to come into property? Mm -hmm. You need it for you know, US wind, US quake, Japanese wind, Japanese quake, mm -hmm. things like that, right? So a lot of times they're bundled within the original policy, right? And then you have all the other side um, uh, you know, coverages that you get out of that, the fire, the AOB, all those kind of things, right? But I mean, like if, again, if you went back to the pre-1950s when you were se selling monoline policies and maybe instead you have like a wind-only coverage in Florida, earthquake-only coverage again in California, and you can, you know, actually have a proper market rate for that and people bought it, that that's scalable, right? That's a very sim simple 
place that needs capital that could easily you know, bring in institutional dollars because it's very transparent, simple, scalable, right? And, and just leave the other risks with the insurance carriers, which are also, I just wanted to point out, are still backed largely by institutional investors as well. Right, exactly. They just happen to not right. speak as vociferously about all the other perils that they're picking up and stuff, but, but then to figure it out in a different way. But then rather than trying to get indemnity covers, scaling and cap bonds for all perils all the time, you, you focus on the key perils and just try to get more capital to support yeah. that part of it. I'm not sure I could agree with that, though. I mean, because I, I think that's, that's, that's one of the levers that people always love to talk about is that I'm going to structure this deal. I'm going to figure out a way that, you know, I can solve for the fact that I think the risk is, you know, Five and you think the risk is one, so we're going to go and we're, we're going to create a, a, a contract where we're, we're able to solve for both these things. And you get to pretend happily that it's one until the actual loss occurs, and then uh, I go and tell you, "Sorry, I'm not paying you for that five because you know the contract says this," and and then it just goes to the courts and whatnot. So you, you what, what ends up happening is, you know, I, I think we kind of fool ourselves sometimes where. We think we can be clever and try to like, you know, underwrite, you know, like cut some of the risk out and we just create more parameter risk and just more, you know, just just more, you know, um, you know, more unknown aspects. I mean, I, you know, I'll use a great example that, that I've always found fascinating was um, during the financial crisis, uh, the Swiss banks would go and loan money to to like Eastern Europe, like Poland and Hungary. And they didn't want to take the currency risk of Polish, you know, currency or hung Hungarian currency, so they put it in Swiss francs. But the reality is, the people that they lent money to were getting paid in Polish currency and Hungarian currency. So, you know, of course, they end up defaulting on their mortgages when the exchange rates, you know, move against you. So, I mean, you're, you know, you're almost just kind of putting your head, you're poking your head in the ground, trying to pretend like, oh, look, I took that currency risk out of the equation, and like, no, it's, it's still there. You know, it's the same thing with. I, I've sold policies to people in Florida that were X wind and not flood, and their house was washed away from like Hurricane Michael. They predictably come back and sue us. They don't. I mean, you know, now I still have to spend money going and explaining to a jury that they don't have wind coverage, they don't have flood coverage. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle. I mean, we're we're dealing with that in the insurance space now, where the insurance coverage is expanding further, where it's not even just it's fortuitous risk anymore. It's these ma it's predictable maintenance, like these roof replacements and and whatnot. So I, I mean, I think you know, I, I I think the the bigger issue is we have to attract capital, and we have to have capital just really understand, just get real about the fact that you know this is a messy business, just like life, you know, and that you're you you're gonna get you're gonna have surprises. I mean, I've paid out billions of dollars of claims over the years, and I can tell you all the examples of where. You know, it was stuff that I thought made sense, and then there were cases where, you know, it, it, look, it was it was a surprise, and you learn from it. The market reprices, and you know, maybe the answer is you just walk away and say, "Well, I'm never going to do this. I can't do, I can't do wildfire in California because you know they're just running out of water, and it's just going to continue to get worse." But um, but yeah, I I, I, I think the, the the problem is when you start pigeoning, pigeonholing yourself into saying, well, we're gonna cut the coverage or we're gonna more narrowly define our, our structures, it's, it, it's just more of the same, just putting the cap on bar market into this little pigeonhole, you know, this little corner of the universe where it will never meet its, its true promise, which, I mean, there's two sides of the coin, right? I mean, we have, we have needs, but you know, there's the same thing on the investor side too. There's, the world's awash with capital and they, they have to figure out what to do with it because Putting it in negative interest rate, you know, uh, government securities, or, you know, I mean, look how much the, the stock market has bid up. I mean, well, do, can we realistically think the stock market's going to keep going up at 20, 30 percent, or is that symptomatic of the the bond markets being so so heavily depressed? But I guess what I would argue about that with surprises is, surprises are okay if you're getting paid to take the surprises. Exactly. If you're an equity investor. But if you're a cap bond investor, you're taking a specific layer of risk, and you shouldn't have surprises in the cap. So we're but talking you, about you, you know, a lot equity, of products. But you take equity like risk, and when you when you're writing sub you know sub investment grades, I mean like like I mean that's what I find so fascinating about some of these discussions on cap bonds is nobody ever talks about when they invest in font in Ford's bonds that you know, I didn't understand that I could have a problem where Ford wasn't manufacturing as many vehicles because of a ship shortage. 
that's not fair. I want that written out of the contract now if they have a problem with their, you know. So, you, I mean, you just take idiosyncratic risk in all these credits all the time, but people just kind of convince themselves that, oh, no, I understand that risk. It's credit. That's fine. But well, here all yeah, of a sudden, and I, and I like, joke yeah. about that too. People say they understand credit, and that's a whole nother, yeah, a whole nother panel discussion. But you know, I think that that's why quotas. So we talk broadly about there are a lot of different products with a lot of different risk return profiles. So I think that when we talk about these broader risks and sort of maybe the volatility, shall we, shall we say, about sort of what that ultimate profile looks like. They want to know that there's real upside. They're willing to go there. There's real downside, but their eyes are wide open to the upside and the downside. And, and I think that one of the problems with a lot of these quota share vehicles is that for multiple years in a row, certain vehicles have only seen one side of that equation, that it's only been the downside. And so I think that this is sort of the year where we're you know, hopeful that we will have. Um, but. I, the one thing I do want to say is that, as a sort of a side advertisement, not all vehicles are lost money. So not all investors. It's 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 really a mixed bag in this asset class. There really are. I mean, from my sort of perspective of looking broadly, it does seem like there are winners and losers, and how you want to participate. So it really, you know, cap bonds are a certain risk return profile. There shouldn't be surprises because there's no upside. There's no upside. Yes, I guess you could be a total return investor and you can trade in and out, but there really isn't the upside that you would see in whether it's a quota share or um, in other types of uh, you know sidecar like vehicles. Um, and but, I just think but you're that we paid just a need risk to premium for that though. But the risk premium is also based on this expertization from these third party firms that. I think that we all need to be in agreement of how we think about that and what you're getting paid for. But I see that we have seven minutes left, and, and, I, and I want to sort of open this up because I, I feel like all you guys are sort of smarter than, than or at least I, I can say that, not for necessarily the three of you. But you know, any perspectives or questions on how we can make this broader? relatively new to the space. Andy Stewart um, from a exchange capital or a wealth management firm mm -hmm. serving high net worth investors in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys have talked a lot about the supply side in terms of growing the market. I, wanted, I have a question about the demand side. Mm -hmm. right? Institutional investors, you keep talking about them. Do interval funds and mutual funds available to you know regular uh, retail investors with a few million dollars who are our clients, mm -hmm. is that a source of good capital for this space? Or are our clients and even my investment committee too fickle, not institutional, and, and kind of a, a, a sideshow to the whole space of reinsurance? Or is it a real source of growth and good investor class? I, you know, at least my, and I, and I certainly would appreciate all your opinions. I think that it really depends on what the mission is of the product or the fund manager that you're investing through. Um, because typically through the, you would invest through a, a fund, these interval funds. So I think, it, 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 you know, not all interval funds, I mean, this is somewhat analogous to the USIT pro, uh, product in Europe. Um, not all are created equally, and it's, you know, are you getting paid? Are you sharing an upside? I, I don't know which, you know, particular fund you're looking at, but are you getting paid for the risk that you're taking? And, and I absolutely think that it's appropriate, um, but I should be wide open to what it is that you're actually taking. So, I yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean there's pl plenty of examples where obviously that money is contributed to the space, and I think it's 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 it's, it's valuable and it's capital. So, well. so, so in, in that sense, I think it's it's really more a question on obviously for, for for the most part through these funds, you're taking obviously insurance risk, and 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 volatility goes with that. Um, so as long as there's a clear understanding on. Kind of what's the risk return profile is? I think the answer is yes. I think that is uh, has been capital which has been in the space or in Europe in the usage funds. I think there's plenty of examples in the U.S. as well um, who are actively participating in the market. And and uh, I agree with you. I think that certainly can be an area of 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 continued growth in in, in the marketplace as well. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in in the end, everyone that holds this risk is an individual. Right, so whether you're a high net worth individual that goes through an advisor or you're the 
you know, Dutch nurse that trusts the future pension obligations being paid to you, um, you're the one bearing the risk. I mean, so it's a, you know, it, it's it really just comes down to, um, you know, should you be advising that? I mean, you know, I, I don't think I'm in a position to to tell you yes or no. You should, you know. A, a specific class of individuals should bear it, but let me ask. I mean, should a four million dollar couple um, who have you know a lot of liquidity and and other wealth be able to bear this risk versus the Dutch nurse? I, I don't know. I mean, I would think they'd probably be better suited than than an individual like that. So, but the one thing I would say is that I do think it's appropriate. We generally have had the perspective that we wouldn't sell retail; that we're not going to sell to your you know, end clients of your firm, that we do want that middleman. And so you know, the funds that do exist right now, I, I do believe have a, a, that level of sophistication that can analyze, as long as then your clients are well aware of the risk profile of what it is that these funds are investing in. I, I certainly think that is appropriate. I don't know, any, any other questions, comments? Thank you, Steve. Again, I'm Ross Stein from Tembler. A number of you have talked about the need for more transparency. But as I understand it, the modeling agents on these bonds are proprietary. These are basically black boxes. So how can you use those tools and gain greater transparency for the investors? Well, well you know, one, one of the things I'd, I'd add to that is that um, yeah, the, the, the modeling companies do argue that they have proprietary technology. but you know, when you look at the evolution of, of cat risk, it, it's, it's incredible where, where, where we were 30 years ago versus today. I mean, even large companies weren't aggregating risk and had any clue how much concentration they were writing in Miami or, you know, pre-Andrew and Hugo. The, the cat bonds, you know, uh, it, I mean, sorry, the cat models took some time to develop. But, but I think the real, the real genesis of the modern cat models and, 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 and the progression of the technology really comes back to the, the Florida Commission and uh, the, the Florida Hurricane Cat Fund. And if, if you look at the documentation in the Florida Commission, it's voluminous. Each of the cat, each of the cat models has to get annually, or I think semi-annually, I mean, biannually certified. And they have to, to, to really laser in on what kind of data they use to calibrate, whether it's lost data, the, the meteorological data. So, there is quite a bit of information. I mean, I, I, my argument is that I think that's one of the most exciting things about the 144A, um, you know, for an end investor is the fact that you have a lot of risk standardization. Um, the challenge is, and, and this is the difference of me being a, an actuary and a professional insurer and we insurer over the years, is that you still have to have a, a roadmap of, you know, where do the models work better and where they don't. And, you know, we, we keep learning after major events, you know, I mean, we'll, you know, we get thumped on the head and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, this was supposed to be like a, a one in a hundred and it was like a one in 10,000 event. Um, but, but when you look at the hurricane modeling in particular, the, you know, thankfully or un unfortunately, uh, hurricanes are pretty frequent. So we've done a lot of calibration of that data over the years. And, and yeah, there are still surprises, but, you know, I'd, I'd argue that that's some of the better modeled risk out there. Earthquake, you know, is much more remote, so we, we, we have a lot more questions of how, how the models will perform when we see major events or as we see major events. And, and then clearly, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a continuum from there. You know, there's, 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 there's obviously greater questions about the accuracy of the models for tornado hail, winter storm, uh, wildfire. But I think, Ross, just to build on what Dave was saying, is that these models are also licensed. So many, many of our investors license these models, and, and they can tweak it also for you know, their own portfolio construction. Um, they can see how the different uh, bonds fit together. But what I would say is make the analogy back to the mortgage market is that you know, there are prepayment models in the mortgage market, and everybody has their own view on prepayment speeds. And they'll, you know, people have these models, and then they'll tweak it how they look at it and have different sensitivities. And I think that that's the same in our market. There are these different vendor models. You can have a view. You can tweak it. It's, to me, it's, it's very similar to that in that regard of you know, having your own view. You can license it. 
um, and then play with it as, you know, and then, you know, have difference in price. So that there isn't a uniform view on prepayment speeds, um, for example. So there aren't uniform views of sort of wind risk or what have you. So from that perspective. So I see that we're at zero, and I see Steve looking at us. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.